So welcome everybody to the uh, CMSA Tsinghua Literature Seminar. This is a series that was founded by S.T. Yao, and we're fortunate to have Professor Yao who wants to say a few words about the series. Well, it's great. Uh, so uh, we start uh, today again, the CMSA Tsinghua Math Science Literature uh, Lecture. This whole series began about four years ago when I was still the director of CMSA. Uh, I thought it was a good series and we have many distinguished uh, mathematicians who gave uh, beautiful lectures and many of them are in record. I think uh, I learned a lot myself in the whole uh, last four years and I did not miss any one of them. And uh, I retired about two years ago. I think our new director, Dan Free, has done a great job. And I'm glad that she, he continued this series. And today I see Cameron Gordon, who is a close friend of mine for a long, long time. Put it on there. When, uh, you know, about 40 years ago, uh, he helped. And we, we solved the Smith conjecture with several people together. And so I will turn it to Dan to introduce uh, Cameron. Uh, thank you. So uh, so today we're very pleased to have Cameron Gordon from the University of Texas at Austin, and he's going to tell us about the unknotting number of a knot. Cameron. Well, uh, thank you, Dan, for the introduction, and thank you for the invitation uh, to come and give this lecture. It's nice to uh, be able to visit the other Cambridge. I'm enjoying my visit. Um, so I want to talk about uh, my one of my favorite uh, knot invariants, the unknotting number of a knot, and it's it's one of the oldest and most natural invariants of a knot, and yet it's uh, <clears throat> it's proved to be quite elusive, and uh, there are many uh, unanswered questions about it, and um, many of the things that are known about it actually require some of the deepest sort of mathematical developments in, in knot theory and the low dimensional topology generally. So. Um, the talk will be basically historical. I mean, I'll try to indicate how uh, sort of uh, advances in low dimensional topology have have, have led to uh, un uh, understanding, uh, to some extent at least, of this uh, of this invariant. But um, let me let, before I uh, even define uh, the unknown number, let, let me just uh, give, give give an account of some of the early the early work in, in knot theory. Well, okay, so first of all, a, de a definition. So a knot is just a, it's just a closed loop in, let's say, in the three sphere, uh, the one point compactification of, of space. And th there's a uh, there's a special knot, of course, which is the unknot, just the trivial. By the way, yeah. So two knots are regarded as being equal. You know, it's the it's the obvious definition. If one can be kind of deformed to the other, you know, continuously in, in space. So uh, we have the unknot or the trivial knot. Uh, so here's here's some pictures of, of of knots. This knot is the same as this knot, which obviously it's the same as this knot. Strictly speaking, it's not the same as this one, because this one is actually the reflection of that one. Um, uh, and it turns out they're actually not. This one cannot be deformed to this one. But for some purposes, one does regard these as being the same. For some purposes, one doesn't. But I'll be a little vague on that. Um, and, uh, you know, one's... One studies knots, uh, you know, through um, through pictures like this. Uh, here are some. Uh, here are a couple of other knots that I'll come back to in, in a little while. Um, but this is a so-called diagram of a knot, where you know you you you, you indicate the uh, projection in the plane, and then you indicate wh wh where the where the, the the pieces of the of the string go over, over and under. Okay, right, let's next. Okay, so. Um, there's an obvious operation on knots, the sum of, of knots. You just you tie one knot here, then you tie the other one further along. And uh, you say that a knot, okay. Yeah, so you say that a knot is prime if it's not the sum of two non-trivial knots. Yes, next. And uh, ob the, the most obvious invariant of a knot is the crossing number. So if you have a diagram uh, of the kind I, I also, you can just count the number of crossings in that diagram, that's C of D. And if you minimize that over all diagrams of the knot, then you get the crossing number of the knot. 
Okay, and so um, really uh, the person who really started making a, a significant attempt to understand notes was P.G. Tate in the middle of the uh, 19th century, second half of the 19th century. And he ended up classifying prime notes with crossing number up to 10. Yeah, next. So here's, here's Tate, uh, Peter Guthrie Tate. And uh, like, many, like many branches of mathematics, not theory got its impetus from physics, actually. Um, in, in the sort of middle of the 19th century, the prevailing atomic theory was the theory of vortex atoms, which basically stipulated that atoms were little knotted vortices in the ether, which you know, permeated everything. And the idea was that different knots would correspond to different elements. And so Lord Kelvin, who was a big proponent of this theory, he was at Glasgow. His, he was a good friend of Tate, who was at Edinburgh. And so he asked Tate, well, has anyone you know, investigated knots? You know? And Tate said, well, not to my knowledge. Uh, let, let me have a go. So he spent the next 30 years of his life <laughs> investigating. But meanwhile, of course, the theory of vortex atoms uh, sort of gradually, gradually came, went out of fashion. But, but Tate was a character and a uh, very smart guy. He called uh, the, the cross of number the order of knottiness. Um, Next, please. And so here, this is one of the tales from one of his early papers. This is the first seven orders of naughtiness. Um, so these are basically these are basically all the knots up to nine crossings. You see, the first there are no knots with well, there are no non-trivial knots with zero, one, or two crossings. And the first one you get is with three crossings, and then there's one with four crossings. Anyway, and then he eventually pushed this further up to here's tenfold naughtiness. So he eventually classified uh, knots up to up to ten crossings. I'll qualify this in a little while, but um, and um, his task was was carried on by other people. So by the turn of the century, there were tables of knots up to eleven crossings. Okay, now, um, and so there we are, up to eleven crossings. You get this, of course, with the advent of computers, things really took off, and now the latest uh, is that all knots, all prime knots, up to nineteen crossings are known. So up to 19 crossings, there are 352,152,252 prime knots. A lot of knots. <clears throat> okay, next, next. Okay, sorry, go back. Okay, back, 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 back. <laughs> this is tricky. <laughs> Teamwork. Um, but okay, so because but this raises a question. You see, the, the early tabulators, like, like Tate, I mean, he had no way of knowing that two knots that looked different really were different. In fact, he had no way of knowing that Maybe every knot was the unknot, you know. Uh, there were no uh, rigorous mathematical uh, techniques available. Uh, by the turn of the century, that changed, of course, by the turn of the, you know, the, the 20th century. So around about 1900, you know, Poincaré defined the fundamental group, and then you could actually prove that there were non-trivial knots and so on. Let me, um, but the early, the early tabulators did, didn't have that advantage, and it's amazing that they, they, got, they, got, they got things pretty, pretty well right, actually. But let me, okay, next. Let me um, now uh, mention uh, an early knot invariant that actually does tell you that some knots are um, non-trivial uh, and, and, and that some knots are not equivalent to other knots. So if you take a knot diagram, so you take some picture like this, you can always shade the regions alternately black and white like this here, okay? The so-called checkerboard shading. And then, next please, uh, at each crossing, I want to assign a sign, either plus or minus one, according to this rule here. If the black regions tend to twist in the negative direction, I'll put a plus, and if they, tend to, if they twist in the positive direction, I'll put a minus. So here I've indicated those um, signs here. Better check I got them right, because it's easy to get them wrong. Okay, then now we label the white regions, the unshaded regions, so I'll label them zero, one, two and three, so next slide, please. So we, so these are the white regions, let's say R0 up to Rn. And so I wanted to find a symmetric n plus one by n plus one matrix, G bar, and the off diagonal entries, G i j bar, when i is not equal to, I'm just gonna look at all the crossings where region R sub i and R sub j are incident. And I just sum this, these signs over all such crossings. And then finally, uh, Next slide. Uh, the diagonal entries, we fill those in to make each row and column sum zero. So let, let me do that. This is really easy. It's a great, it's a, I, I love this invariant. Um, so if we just go back to, back, 
back. Uh, yeah, to, to this one here. So you see, let's look. So the zero one entry, right? It's going to be how many crossings are incident to this re region zero and region one? Well, there are three, right? And they're all negative. So there's going to be a minus three in the zero one entry. So if we go over the next, okay, next, next. Okay, so there we are. So I filled it in. So minus three there and so on. So all you need to do, you just fill in the upper diagonal part of this by looking at the, at the diagram. And now you make it symmetric. And then you add the diagonal entries to make each row sum and, each, and therefore each column sum zero. Okay, now finally, next slide, please. You, you delete your favorite row and corresponding column and now you've got a symmetric n by n matrix. So let's do that. We, I deleted the most complicated row and column. I'm left with this. And actually, you know, you can actually diagonalize this one over the integers. Usually you can't do that, but I mean, this is congruent over Z. And this one happens to be congruent to this in the sense of, you know, um, representing the same, um, you know, bilinear form. You can, and so here we are. Anyway, um, but, but basically you, 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 you get this matrix. And there are many invariants of this matrix that turn out to be invariants of the knot. So next slide, please. Uh, G is called the Geritz matrix, a Geritz matrix. This was invented by Geritz, 1933. And in particular, the absolute value of the determinant of this matrix turns out depend, it depends only on the knot. And it's independent of all, all other choices. So that's an invariant of the knot. And um, in particular, then, the, the example we did, right, that has uh, determinant three. Now, the unknot, which I'll always denote by that, that's the unknot. It has determinant one. And so um, we've just proved that that diagram that I drew, um, actually, it's a non, it's a non trivial knot. On the other hand, the very, very first um, knot that appears in the table is the trefoil with three crossings that also has determinant three. So, uh, uh, you know, as far as this very basic invariant is concerned, um, <clears throat> the knot I just drew could, could be the trefoil. In fact, it, it's not. But anyway, I'll, we'll come back to this. But this Guritz matrix, this will play a, a role much later in, 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 in the discussion of the unknotting number. Um, although it's a very old invariant. Okay, ne next slide, please. Okay, at this point, I want to mention um, a, a particular class of knots, which has always played a kind of special role uh, in knots. It's the alternating knots. So, um, you know, I think people for... <laughs> several thousand years have noticed that if you draw, if you just draw a diagram, you know, if you draw an immersed circle in the plane, you can always put in the crossings so that they alternate over, under, over, under, over, under, right? And this is famously used in, you know, in Celtic uh, artwork. This is a Pictish example. This is a Celtic example. So this is a so-called alternating knot. Except you've probably noticed this isn't a knot. This actually has more than one component. This also has more than one component. But anyway, you get the idea. Um, so next slide, please. So that's an alter so a diagram is alternating if the crossings alternate over under, and a knot is alternating if it has an alternating diagram. So again, this will play a role in what I have to say later. But it was early kind of recognized that if all knots were alternating, then knot theory would be would be much easier. It wouldn't be trivial, but it, it would be much easier. Um, so luckily, you know, if, if we want to keep our jobs, there are non-alternating knots. Um, what happened? Oh, oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, so let me. Um, yeah. Okay. At this point, let, let me yeah, define um, the notion of a nuclear cross. If you have a diagram with a crossing like this, where you've got a bunch of junk here and a bunch, you can also just untwist it, right? And, and you can get rid of it very easily. And if this diagram was alternating, when you rotate this to get rid of it, it, it turns out you're still alternating. So, so in all, and really with a knot drawing, you can, you can always assume that it's reduced, you know, it has no nuclear knotting. So one of the first uh, interesting theorems about alternating knots was uh, next, the next the theorem of Banquets, 1930. If you have a reduced alternating diagram of a knot, it's alternating, then the determinant is greater than or equal to the number of crossings. So what does this say about the example I just did a few minutes ago? <clears throat> the determinant was three, right? If, if it was a, an alternating knot, it would have a reduced alternating diagram. 
And therefore, it would have a reduced alternating diagonal with, at most, three crossings. So it actually would have to be the trefoil. And you could prove it's not the trefoil. So actually, that example I, I gave, that's a proof now. Once you've shown it's not the trefoil, uh, it, it's not an alternating knot. It doesn't have any alternating diagonal. In fact, um, you know, the, the number of alternating knots, uh, the percentage of alternating knots among all knots is, um, is, uh, is fairly small. I, I should say, by the way, while um, getting back here, um, when I mentioned Tate, it, it actually, he, if, if you go way back to his the Tate's tables, back, 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 there. You'll actually see that there, are, there aren't any crossings indicated over under, right? So in fact, he he just he just classified alternating knots. Actually, he was aware that not alternating knots existed, but he just classified. And then later on, other people um, took took up the idea of uh, the, the challenge of classifying non alternating knots. So, okay. Yeah. Um, But one, and, and this brings us a little bit closer to um, the unloading number. Uh, one um, really interesting corollary of this is that, well, if you think about it, this says that the only reduced alternating diagonal of the unknot, see, if you're the unknot, the determinant is one. And so the number, if you have a reduced alternating diagram, then um, the crossing number is at most one. Well, it would have to be, it wouldn't be reduced then. And so the only reduced alternating diagonal of the unknot is a diagonal with no crossings. And that means that there's a really easy algorithm to decide whether or not whether or not an alternating diagram represents the unknot. Because you look at an alternating diagram and you say, oh, does it have a does it have a nugatory crossing? If it does, I'll get rid of it. If it doesn't, and it has more than three, you have three or more crossings, it's not the unknot. And so if, in fact, if we go way back, so let's let's just look at um, I should say that Bankwitz is, yeah, go way back, way back, way back, way back to the very second slide, I think. You see, back, back, there, yeah, okay. See, so this, this is an alternating diagram, right? And there's no nugatory crossing. So you don't have to do anything. You just look at this. Notice there's no nugatory crossing. And you, well, this is a non-trivial knot by Bankwitz's theorem. So that's quite remarkable. Now you see, Bankwitz's theorem doesn't apply to this one because this one is actually not alternating. Look, it's over, over, right? And it's just as well because this is actually the unknot. Um, so there we are, right? Okay, <laughs> it doesn't look like it, but it is. Uh, okay, move on. Okay, so it's a nice easy algorithm um, for the. Um, yeah, no. By the way, again, I should say that uh, people have. I, I talked about people listing knots up to nineteen crossings for alternating knots. See, that's much easier. You don't have to worry about it. Uh, that's been done up to twenty-two crossings. There are 300, did I write this down somewhere? Right, probably not. Next slide, let's see. No, anyway, okay, no, back. Um, there, are, there, are, there are, oh no, yeah, alternate, there are almost 5 billion alternating knots with 22 crossings. <laughs> it's been up there. So, you know, at some point this becomes kind of pointless, but anyway, um, all right, next, next slide. Okay, we have a nice algorithm for alternating knots. But again, this whole tabulation business, it raises the basic question, you know, the unknotting problem. Can you decide whether or not a knot is, is the unknot, is, is trivial? You look at a diagram, is it the unknot? How do you know? More generally, the knot problem, are the knots represented by two given diagrams the same? So these are very, very fundamental questions which arise naturally when you think of them. Um, of uh, tabulating knots. Now, of course, uh, as as time went on, there were more and more knot invariants uh, were um, were discovered or introduced. And of course, one of the first ones next was was the group. So the fundamental group with the complement of a knot. So this is the group, the group of a knot. It turns out that this is actually an extremely strong invariant. So next, please. So in, in 1910, Dane wrote a paper. He proved a famous lemma called Dane's lemma. And as a consequence of that, he showed that a knot is trivial if and only if the fun its group is Z. So that's great. That's a really nice characterization of the unknot. And but in fact, more generally, later, we showed that uh, if, if you have two prime knots, then, then actually they're the same if and only if they're isomorphic groups. So the group is, 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 a, very, is a very good invariant. Could you just go back one? 
but okay, yeah, they are. Right. Um, but, but two things to say about this. The first is, first of all, Dave's proof was incomplete, <laughs> and it's a long story. It wasn't finally proved. His so-called lemma wasn't finally proved until 1957. But it is true, and so we do get this uh, theorem. But even when Dane thought he'd proved this, he, became, he was very much aware that this did not solve the unknotting problem because it reduces it to, to deciding whether this group is isomorphic to Z. And of course, he realized, well, it's not clear that this is an easier problem. And in fact, this is quite influential in his thinking. It led him, it led him to uh, formulate, you know, famously, the three decision problems the isomorphism problem for finely presented groups, the word problem for finely presented groups, and the conjugacy problem. So that, again, just thinking about knots led Dane to formulate those decision problems, which again was a, a very, very important sort of step in, in, uh, uh, yeah, in history of mathematics. Now, by the 1930s, Turing had shown that the halting problem for Turing machines was unsolvable. And, and then gradually this was kind of promoted to more mathematical statements. For example, the word problem for finely presented groups was so shown to be unsolvable in the mid-50s. <clears throat> so by the mid-50s, a lot of problems were being shown to be unsolvable uh, in mathematics, in particular, the homeomorphism problem for manifolds of dimension four and, and, and more. And in fact, the next, well, next, please. This actually led Turing to suggest that maybe the unknowing problem might well turn out to be unsolvable. He wrote a popular article in 1954. He says a similar problem. It's, it, it's similar to the Markov theorem that the homeomorphism problem for manifolds of dimension four uh, was unsolvable. So Turing thought that maybe this might be unsolvable. Next slide. Well, it turns out that it's actually solvable. So in the late 50s, 1958, uh, Wolfgang Hacken announced that he'd shown that the unknowing problem was solvable. And I think it's fair to say that nobody believed him, um, for, I think for three reasons. First, it sort of went somewhat against the prevailing wisdom. Everyone was showing that things were unsolvable. Secondly, his papers were very, very hard to read. Maybe four reasons. Four, thirdly, he didn't have an academic job. <laughs> and fourth, uh, some of the ideas he introduced, one of the famous ideas he introduced was based on a, on a paper that was written by Knazer in 1929. This, and this led to Hacken to describe what he defined what he called the theory of normal surfaces, which led to the solution of this problem. And Knazer's paper was widely misunderstood <laughs> for a variety of reasons. Partly, it was misunderstood because he used Bain's lemma. And just as he was submitting his paper for publication, he had another look at Dane's paper and realized, hmm, he didn't really believe the proof. So there ensued this very interesting correspondence between Knazer and Dane, which is actually in a library at, at UT Austin um, about, about Dane's lemma. And basically Dane said, well, come on, Knazer, you're a young guy. Why don't you just, you know, solve it, you know? But they, they eventually gave up and uh, it, it remained until 1957. But, um, but it turned out that Hawken was actually correct, <laughs> that, uh, that his proof was correct. And, but it involved, you know, well, a import, very important idea that he introduced in three-dimensional topology, the theory, the theory of normal surfaces. And later developments, I mean, by Waldhausen, uh, by 1976, the knot problem was also known to be solvable. <clears throat> You know, I feel like, I don't know if you've ever read the book Tristram Shandy, but it's a very great, great book. It's, it's supposed to be an autobiography, but he never gets around. He, halfway through the book, he's still not born. He keeps, he keeps on getting distracted. So I feel a bit like Tristram Shandy. I still haven't defined the unknotting number, <laughs> which is the title, title of the... So let me immediately correct this. Okay, so next, so... Okay, so Tate, Tate defined the unknotting number. He called it the benottedness. In what follows, the term benottedness will be used to signify the peculiar property in which knots, even when of the same order of knottiness, may thus differ. And we, we may define it, at least provisionally, as the smallest number of changes of sign which will render all the crossings in a given scheme nugatory. The question is, as we shall soon see, a delicate and difficult one. How right he was. <laughs> But okay, so putting his um, definition into modern language, um, it you, really one, he's basically saying this, 
look at a diagram of the knot, you can define the unknotting number of the diagram to be the minimum number of changes of crossing of that diagram that gives you the unknot. And then you can minimize that over all diagrams and you get, that's the unknotting number of the knot. <clears throat> By the way, it's easy to see that if you've got any diagram of a knot, you can always change some crosses to make it the unknot. Well, one way to see this is to take a piece of string and just to lay it down over the diagram, just keep on putting it over, 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 and then join it up. And that's clearly the unknot. And look, it's got the same diagram, except you've changed some crossings. But by the way, next slide. By the way, um, a, a kind of coordinate free definition, uh, it's, it's, it's equivalently just the minimum number of times you must allow the knot to pass through itself in order to unknot it. It's a nice exercise to, to show that, uh, <laughs> to show that uh, you're doing a great job, by the way. <laughs> um, uh, it, 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 it's actually equivalent. Okay. So now we immediately, uh, well, we can ask this question, this other number, it's well-defined. Is it computable? I'll come back to that. Um, let's be more modest. Can you decide whether it, like, is it decidable whether or not a knot has a number one? Next slide. By the way, it's really non trivial to decide whether or not it's a number zero, right? That's just to say it's the unknown. That is decidable, but my goodness, that's a, that's a, that's a very, very difficult proof. So um, one expects that maybe to compute the unknown number, it might, it might be very difficult. So we, we know, thanks to Haken, that we can decide whether or not it has a number zero, but it's actually open, it's still open. This is still open. We can't, we don't know whether it's decidable whether or not. <clears throat> and let, so let me, let me just make a few remarks as to why um, there's no naive um, sort of answer to this. So let's say that a diagram of a knot is minimal if it realizes the crossing number. Okay. So if the crossing number of the diagram is the crossing number of the knot. Okay. Next slide, please. And um, so you see, one problem is uh, that the um, that there exist. Yeah, there are knots such that um, the unknotting number is not realized in any minimum crossing diagram. You see, see if if if, if the unknotting number is always realized in a minimum crossing diagram, then it means you see it would be computable because you can you can compute the unknotting number of a diagram. You can just change, you know, all, all subsets of crossings, and you can use Haken to check do you get the unknot. You know? So that's decidable. But, um, but unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on your point of view, life is not that simple. Um, so here's, um, in fact, next slide. Uh, there are even alternating knots uh, that, that, uh, whose unknotting number is not realized in any minimal diagram. So this is an example where even alternating knots aren't quite, uh, quite as nice as you might think. So here's a very, very simple example. This is actually it's an alternating knot. It's, got, it's only got 10 crossings. You can check that you, you, for every pair of crossings in this diagram, if you change them, you never get the unknot. You can just check that. On the other hand, if you introduce these two uh, sort of gratuitous extra crossings, now if you change that crossing and that one, as you can tell, you get the unknot. Right? No, that was a joke. <laughs> but you do, trust me, trust me. If you're bored, just copy that down and uh, change those crossings and it'll all just magically unwind. So there you are. So, so here's an example where the unknowing number is not realized in the minimal diagram. So, um, okay, next slide, please. Um, on the other hand, no one knows any examples of where this happens where the unknown number is one. So it was conjectured by Cohen that, that uh, if, the un if the unknown number is one, then K is a minimal diagram with, with unknown number one. And um, next, next slide, please. Um, Okay, so let me let me uh, yeah say a little bit more about this. I mentioned that I was going to discuss how you know um, developments in, in in low dimensional topology and knot theory uh, have impacted um, the unknown number. Well, the Jones polynomial, which came along in in 1984, uh, it didn't perhaps directly uh, influence uh, have much to say about the unknown number. It did indirectly, but it, but it did lead to a proof of conjecture in 1987. Um, there's a reduced alternating knot diagram is minimal. Easy to believe. 
uh, very hard to prove, <laughs> but it, it was finally proved, of course, today. And so finally, I'll come back to this much later, by the way, uh, McCoy. So finally, um, if you have an alternating diagram of a knot that has an unknown number one, then in fact, the unknown number of that diagram is one. And so in particular, Cohen's conjecture is true for alternating knots. So here's another example where we know much more for alternating knots than we do in general. <clears throat> Next slide. And again, so there is an algorithm to decide whether or not a given alternating knot has an unknown number one. If you remember, we, Bankwitz gave us a very easy algorithm to decide whether an alternate no, no, it had an number zero. The general case was very difficult. And, and now, now we know at least for another one. But already for, for under number two, you see we have this, we have these examples um, that I just mentioned where the another number is not realized in the, in the minimum crossing diagram. So it, it's just not clear. Let me mention one um, final thing that, um, it was conjectured by uh, independently by Bernard and Jablan that nevertheless, even though the unknown number might not be realized in the minimum diagram, they suggested it might be the case that any non-trivial knot, there is a minimal diagram such that changing some crossing of that does make progress. It does actually give you a knot with smaller unknown number. And if we go back, 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 back. See, this is true for the, this example. Because if you look, See, this, this crossing was actually originally, it was one of the original crossings. So if you change this crossing, you don't get the unknown, but you do get a knot that has smaller unknown number. You get a knot with unknown number one. So uh, there's examples like that that led them to make this conjecture. So next, please. So like I said, the, if you think about it, the, the unknown number one case is precisely Cohen's conjecture, which is still open. And this conjecture would imply that the unknown number is computable, which would be nice. And it is true for those examples I alluded to, the one I just, but of course, next please, it's false. Uh, so it was recently shown, quite recently, that this is false. Well, one thing I find rather fascinating about, about this is that we don't know any, any specific category example. There are four knots, Three eleven crossing knots and one twelve crossing knot. One of them has to be a counterexample, but at the moment nobody knows which of the four it is. So that's kind of fascinating. But anyway, oh, uh, so okay. So let's see. What am I going to talk about next? Let's move on. Okay, next, next slide. Ah, yes. Okay, so let's get back to the unknowning number. Okay, we've decided that it might be hard to. There's no naive reason that it's computable. Okay, there's no naive way to compute it, but. At least we can try to get some information about it. Well, it's of course you can easily get upper bounds for it. You just take a diagram of your knot and you just mess around. Oh, I can change three crosses and I get the unknown. Okay, so the unknowing number of that knot is no more than three. All right, but maybe it's two, <laughs> maybe it's one, maybe it's zero. Yeah, um, and so there you want lower bounds. So there, there are really two main approaches, perhaps. Uh, let me at least say that uh, one is via the double branch cover. Um, so this is a, an old construction goes actually goes way back to Hagar's thesis in, in the 1890s. If you take a knot, uh, then you know the first homology of its complement is Z, and so there's a canonical map to Z2, and uh, the meridian of the knot goes to the generator. You take the double cover, and now you get a twofold cover. But now you can branch, uh, you can fill in a, a, a sort of knot upstairs, and so you get a, a, a map to S3, which is two to one everywhere except along the knot where it's just one to one. It's the kind of thing that's familiar in complex analysis, right? Go, going back to Riemann. But uh, in dimension three, I think it was <clears throat> first noticed by perhaps Hagar. So any, every, every knot has a double branch cover. I'll call it sigma k. It's just a three manifold. The second um, is via the slice genus. So I'll say what that is in a, in, in a minute. But let me, um, so this is a four dimensional uh, idea. Okay, let's, let, but let, let, let me say something about, about uh, some examples here. So, okay, this is very trivial. So the double branch cover of the trivial knot is just the three sphere. The trefoil, uh, that little three crossing knot, the double branch cover of that is the, is the lens space L31. So the lens space is there, just three models obtained by gluing two solid tori together, a well-known uh, easy class of lens spaces whose fundamental groups are cyclic groups. Um, this, this example was slightly, certainly known to Hagard. But anyway, um, yeah, next slide, please. And the Gerritz matrix, this matrix, I, 
described way back. There's actually a presentation matrix for the first homology of the lower branch cover. In particular, this determinant that I talked about, it's just the order of the first homology of the lower branch cover. Okay, next please. So what, how, how, how can looking at the lower branch cover help you understand the unknown number? Well, let's see what happens if you have a not K and a not K prime that are related just by some crossing change in some diagram. So we've got some diagram out here, which is the same, but here as here, but, but the diagrams differ only locally. Now, when we pass to the double branch cover, if you look at a neighborhood of this crossing, you can think of that, you see, there's a, it's just, you think of it as kind of solid cylinder with two vertical arcs, right? Okay, they're kind of twisted a little bit. And it's easy to see that if you take the double branch cover of a disc branched over two points, you just get an annulus. And so the double branch cover of like a solid cylinder like this is just going to be a solid torus, right? And so what's going on here? Yeah, so next. See, if you look at the double branch cover of this guy and compare it with the double branch cover of this guy, it's the same outside. The outside is going to be the double branch cover of some of the sort of tangle that's outside. So that's M. And that to get the double branch cover of this guy, we're going to glue in a solid torus V. And then here, we also glue in a solid torus, but we glue it in, it's glued in in a different way. I mean, there's a, we twist this, we give a complete twist to the boundary here, and we lift it up here. And, um, and so these two double branch covers, they differ by what's called a Dane surgery. In other words, we get from here to here by removing one solid torus and replacing it with another one. So that's Dane surgery on, on and off. And it's important, I mean, there's slightly more, um, if you if you if you care, examine this slightly more carefully, um, the the way uh, these two are glued in, if you look at the meridian of this guy, that's the curve on the boundary of the solid torus that bounds a disc in this one, and the and, and the meridian of this guy, you can think of those. These are two curves on the boundary of M, and they intersect twice. It turns out, okay. So that that's an that's an important fact, okay. So this was noticed. At least the, the first one was noticed by Vent a long time ago, 1937. And uh, he pointed out that this shows that the unknotting number of is at least the minimum number of generators of the first homology of the double branch cover. Because when you do a Dane surgery, if you remove a solid torus and glue it back, you're not going to change the first homology very much. Okay, I mean, that is easy, easy uh, computation. Um, and so, in particular, uh, next. He pointed out that if you take the sum of n copies of the trefoil, then the unknotted number of that really is n. I mean, uh, because uh, you see, the, uh, I pointed out that, that the double branch cover of the trefoil is the length space L31. The first homology you got is Z3. If you take a sum of n copies, you just get up in the double branch cover, you get z n copies of the direct sum of n copies of Z3. And of course, the minimum number of generators of that is n. So um, next slide, please. Yeah, so this, oh, this is Vent's uh, paper, the, the Gordian uh, trivialization of knots. So, um, yeah, for a long time, actually, the unknotting number was known as the Gordian number, right? I mean, it's a, it's a very, uh, very crude way of unknotting a knot, right? <laughs> but, um, let's see how we're doing here. The, okay, next, please. Yeah, the, the, the second the second part of my previous slide, when I noticed that the the that the, 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 these two solid tori are glued in such a way that the two meridians intersect twice, you can interpret this by saying that if you have a knot, a knot with unknotting number one, then the double branch cover, you see, you get it from the unknotting number of the unknot, which is S three, by doing some surgery on some knot, and in the particular surgery. It's so-called M over two surgery. That means you kill M times the meridian and two times the longitude. This two indicates that, um, I mean, I won't take the time to explain the, the notation for Dane surgery, but, but this explains that the, uh, indicates that the, the intersection number of the, uh, the, the new meridian, the, the guy you're killing in the surgery intersects the old meridian uh, twice. And this is known as the Montesinos trick um, used as we'll see, this is used <laughs> big time uh, to to get things about uh, on number one. So next, next week. So theorems about Dane surgery or knots 
by, by the Montesinos trick, give obstructions to certain notes having the unknown. So let me give a couple of examples of that. So the first example is going to be composite notes. So suppose I have the sum of two non-trivial notes. That's a so-called a non-prime knot. Well, the double branch cover is just a connected sum of the two double branch covers. That's easy to see. And next, please. Uh, there's a theorem of Waldhausen. It's a, it's a special case of the Smith conjecture. It was proved uh, before the general Smith conjecture that if you have a non-trivial knot, then the double branch cover is never S3. So in other words, if you have a composite knot, if, these, if none of these guys is trivial, then this is a connected sum. It's a non-trivial connected sum of three manifolds. And if this guy had unknotting number one, you see, um, that means you could obtain a non-trivial connected sum by M over two Dane surgery on, on a knot. Now, the question, when can you get a connected sum of manifolds by Dane surgery on a knot? That's one of the two main problems that are still open about Dane surgery. There's a thing called the Cambrian conjecture. It's still not known when, when exactly when that happens, but next slide. What is known is at least the denominator can't be, can't be one. Um, I'm sorry, can't be two. It can't be two. It has to, so in other words, if you do Dane surgery in a knot and you get an on triple connected sum, it can happen actually. But, but if it does happen, then the L has to be one. So it can't be two. So that means you could never uh, array. So that means that the unknotting number of a connected sum is never, is never one. So it's corollary. So it's a corollary that the unknotting number one implies that K is prime. You might notice that 1985 came before 1987. <laughs> so, because this is not the original proof. Uh, Charlemagne's proof was just a very beautiful, direct combinatorial proof. Uh, this is by no means an easier proof, but I just wanted to indicate how uh, you know it, it ties up with a theorem about Dane surgery giving uh, things about. Um, okay, next slide, please. So the other, other example I want to give um, of this connection are the, uh, the so-called two bridge knots. So let me explain something about what a, a two-bridge knot is. So if you take a, a rational number, p over q, p, q relatively prime, and you take p to be odd, then I take a continued fraction expansion of that, which I'll indicate here, just a1 plus 1 over a2. But then if I look at these um, terms in the continued fraction expansion, next place, I can then form a knot by, uh, by this rule. Uh, you put in a certain number of twists here, a, A1, you put in A1 crossings here, and then you move over, you get A2 crossings, A3, and so on and so on. And then you, you, you finish off. Um, and uh, there's a sign convention. I mean, the, a, the I's might be positive, might be negative, and I won't bother to discuss it right now. But, uh, suffice it to say that if all the AIs are, are positive, then this is an alternating diagram, okay? Um, and I guess this, when n is odd, you finish it off like this. When n is even, of course, it's a little more, you finish it off somewhere else. Anyway, you get, you, get, you get a knot. If p is odd, you get a knot. And this is the so-called rational knot, kp over q, or two-bridge knot, kp over q. It's called a two-bridge knot because if you, look, if you turn this on its side, you see that there's a Morse function, you know, that just has two maxima, or sort of two bridges. Next slide. Um, so these were studied by Schubert in 1956 in particular, and then he showed that the double branch cover of the two bridge knot P over Q is actually the length space LPQ. So, by the way, Schubert was, as well as doing this, he was the one that actually read Harkin proof of the solution of the unknowing uh, problem and understood it and realized it was correct and wrote a version that other people could understand. So he was actually quite influential in bringing Harkin's work into the, into the mainstream. Anyway, next slide, please. So I want to, before I, um, I, let, I um, yeah, I'm talking about two bridge knots, I'm talking about two bridge knots, about the, on the, whether they have unknown number one, but in order to explain the Dane surgery theorem that I'm going to use to, uh, to discuss that, I have to, I have to introduce this other class of knots, the torus knots. So they will also, reappear later, but in a different context. So this is a well-known class of knots, so studied for a long time. If you take just a standard torus in S3, so I just think of it as identifying the edge of a square, I can take, I can take uh, a curve that wraps, uh, this one, I guess it wraps, you know, seven times around in this direction. It intersects this green thing seven times, and it intersects the blue one four times, so it wraps four times around in this direction. So if I have any two co-prime integers, then I can get this knot 
that lies uh, on the on the standardly embedded torus in, in S3. That's a, that's a torus knot. Okay, they're a very nice class of knots. Um, next slide, please. And so the Dane surgery theorem that I want to use um, to say whether or not a two bridge knot has under number one is this theorem. So this this is a corollary of a of the so-called cyclic surgery theorem that was proved in 1987. I think I've run out of juice. Oh no, here we are. Okay, um, and this says that that if you have a surgery on a knot in S3, you see, it gives a length space. Remember, that, that would be relevant to the two-bridge knot case because the double branch cover of a two-bridge knot is a length space. Then either the denominator has to be one, in particular, it can't be two, which is great, or, or J is a torus knot. So that means that if a two-bridge knot has under number one, then its double branch cover would have to be M over two surgery on some torus knot. And the torus knots are very well understood, and uh, you can eventually, so next slide, please. And so this leads to this theorem of Kanaruba Murakami that a two bridge knot has another one if and only if P over Q has a continued fraction of this very special form. Next slide. And it's really nice because it, it says that if and only if it obviously has another number one. In other words, uh, the continued, you see, you just get these, you get these A1 through AK, and then you get minus AK through minus A1. And then here you've got this plus or minus two. And so if you change one of the crossings here, then this, this comes undone. And then everything else just unravels because they, they all cancel. And you have left with this arbitrary number of things here. <clears throat> so that's a nice... Um, uh, <clears throat> The description of the knots with underwear. You, you might notice that 1986 also came before 1987, which is, a, but that's because the preprint was available <laughs> before 1987. So, so th this proof did use did use the. Uh, um, um, thank you very much. All right. Yeah. No, I, I, I Thanks a lot. Yeah. Right. Okay. Good. Um. Right. Right. Okay. Um, yeah. So before I move on to uh, B, let, let me just say that okay, it, it, it's sort of interesting that the the two in surgery theorems that I mentioned here that solve the problem of another number one for connected sums and for um, two bridge knots, they're actually as I mentioned the first one, they are the two. Uh, Dane surgery problems that in general are still open. Um, namely, you know, when, for which knots is there a Dane surgery gives you a non trivial connected sum? The conjecture is that it, it only happens for cable knots, a very, very special situation, but it's, it's also. The other one you see was about lens spaces. See, in both cases, we know that the surgery, if it does exist, it would have to be integral. L would have to be one. And that's enough. For this application, but it's not, not enough to solve. So this, the second question, Dane surgery problem, is the Berge conjecture um, about which knots have surgery give, give you lens spaces, and again, that's uh, that's still open. So um, okay, um, and again, actually, we'll come back to that as well <laughs> a little bit later when we get there. All right, uh, let's move on to B. Uh, next next slide, please. Yeah. Okay, so. Um, I mentioned that B was involved in this thing. I didn't, uh, the slice genus, okay. Okay, so every knot bounds an orientable surface in the three sphere, that's uh, not too hard to see. And you can define the genus of the knot, then this would be the minimum genus of all such surfaces, right? So <clears throat> a knot has genus zero, uh, if and only if it's the unknot. It, it, this means it bounds a disk. In fact, by the way, th this is the basis of Harkin's algorithm. I mean, he says, how do you decide whether a knot's the unknot? Well, he says, if it's the, it's the knot, if, it, if it only if it bounds a disk. So basically, you drill the knot out, and now you've got a three manifold with, let, let's say, a boundary, a torus. And if the knot's the unknot, then there must be some curve on that torus that bounds a disk. And he shows that you can decide whether or not there is such a disk uh, using his theory of normal normal surfaces. So um, anyway, OK, that's the genus. But, now, but there's a four-dimensional notion. The, the slice genus, 
So instead of looking at surfaces in S3, you can look at surfaces in the four ball whose boundary is the not K in, in the three sphere, right? So let's look at smooth, smooth orientable surfaces uh, in the four ball. And we let's minimize that, we get the slice genus. So of course, next slide, uh, the slice genus is certainly no more than the genus, but there are many, many examples of course, if the slice genus is zero, that says the knot bounds a disk in the four ball, and that's called a slice knot. And of course, it's a huge problem which knots are sliced. I mean, it's still a lot, lot of work uh, trying to understand that. Okay, but 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 how is this related to unknotting number? Well, if you have a knot with un with unknotting number U K, what you can do is you can um, you can imagine starting in S three and move sort of up into into the four ball by you start with the knot and then you move up. And if you want to change a crossing, well, just, just pass the thing through itself and then pass the thing through. Eventually you get the unknot. Okay, after K something, tap that off. Now you've got a disk with U of K singularities. It's very simple transverse double points. And what you can do for each of those double points, you can just move a little neighborhood of it. And instead of putting in the two disks, you put in a little amulus. And now you get an embedded surface, but now it has genus. And of course, it's genus U UK. So this is the, the basic um, observation is that your nodding number uh, is at least uh, the slice genus. So if you get lower bounds on the slice genus, then you've got lower bounds. So, so how are we going to get lower bounds on the slice genus? OK, well. Next, let's get back. Let's go back to S three. Um, let's take an orientable surface in S three whose boundary is the knot. Then associated with that is this uh, the so called Seifert form. Uh, it's it's just a bilinear form from the first homology of F cross first homology of the Z. Uh, this goes back to Seifert in the nineteen thirties. A very classical classical invariant. It gives rise to m many invariants. Uh, so you define this by taking you take two one cycles on the surface. And because F is orientable, it has a positive normal direction. And so you can push one of those off in the positive direction. Now you've got this two disjoint one cycles in S3, so they've got a linking number. And so that's the, the way you define this. And so this, this is given by a 2G by 2G plus by one matrix. Now, of course, this matrix A, it's not symmetric, but if you you can just add it to its transpose, <laughs> it's a cheap way to get a symmetric matrix, and um, and that, so that matrix has a signature, and so you can define the signature of the knot sigma k to be the signature of this symmetric matrix. It, it turns out to be an even integer, and it turns out to depend only on. That's uh, we see. Okay, uh, next next slide, but but actually um, it also is related to, it has a four dimensional sort of interpretation as well. Namely, I can take this surface in S3, I can push the interior slightly into the interior of the, of the four ball. And now I can look at the double branch cover of the four ball branched over this, this properly embedded surface. Surface F, let me call that sigma F. It turns out then that the intersection form on the second homology, it turns out the second homology of this double branch cover is just the first homology of this surface. And the intersection form is actually given by this symmetric intersection form is given by A plus A transpose. So next slide, please. And so that means that the signature of the knot is the signature of this, of this four manifold. And notice, of course, the boundary of this four manifold is the double branch cover of, of, of the knot K, which is our old friend from, you know, part A, as, as it were, right? But what consequences of this, of this, okay, now, but now, yeah, next slide. It follows that I can take any surface F prime in the four ball with smooth, you know, blah, 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 embedded with boundary the knot. And I'm so, and I, I can take the double branch cover of the four ball over that guy, and I still get the same signature. I mean, this is, you can use the G signature theorem to prove this, or, you know, whatever you like, there's different ways to do it. But um, the point is that really the signature is, um, yeah, it, 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 it's a signature of any. <clears throat> The four manifold I get by taking the double branch cover. And so next slide, please. And so remember we so that means that the absolute value of the signature, well, it's at most the dimension of the two-dimensional homology of uh, this branch cover. And it's easy to see that is like just twice the genus of F prime. And so we get that if we if we choose this to minimize 
we choose f prime to minimize to realize the slice genus you see we get that the a lower bound for the slice genus is half the absolute value of the signature and in particular then because this is a lower bound for the unknown number we get the unknown number is at least one half the absolute value of the signature so this was proved by murasugi um he introduced the signature actually yeah he introduced the signature and and um he proved this. His proof was a little bit different, but but um, anyway, that's it. So let me give an example. <clears throat> Next slide. So let's look at the. Um, I talked about these torus knots, PQ torus knots. So let's take a very simple case where P is two. So a two Q torus knot just looks like this. It's got one, two, three, four. This is this is the two five torus knot. Uh, in general, I just have a picture like this, and it's pretty easy to see. Look at if I change every other crossing here, you see, I, I clearly get the unknot, right? Because it, it, now this is just over, 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 over. This just all, you know, comes undone. I, I end up with one crossing and then I can. So more generally, so what is this? What is this? This is Q minus one over two, right? So next slide. So this shows that the unknotting number of the two Q torus knot is, it's um, at most, Q minus one over two, right? Next slide. But the signature, you can easily compute the signature uh, of this. Uh, I, you can easily take a nice orientable surface uh, sort of obtained by kind of shading these two things. It's an easy computation depending on the sign. Anyway, you get minus Q minus one. And so the, because that tells you that, the, that uh, because half the absolute value of the signature is a lower bound, we get that the unknotted number of this is exactly q minus one over two. So here's another here's a nice class of knots, so we know exactly what the what the unknotted number is. Unfortunately, you say, well, hey, well, let's let's do any let's do arbitrary torus knots. Unfortunately, the signature it works for two other guys. It works for the three four torus knot and the three five torus knot, but then it, it just it's just not strong enough. And so for many for many years, this was a a big problem. Next slide. So an old idea, again, this goes back to the 1920s and 30s even, that um, some knots are realized as the sort of link of, of isolated singularity of a, of a you know, complex curve in the complex plane. Um, so the idea is that we've, uh, we've got some, I think I really have run out of juice here, is that right? Not that it matters, but let me see. I think I've got another one. I think this one is interesting. Oh, this one works. Okay, okay, good, good, good. Okay, good. Yeah. So, uh, so I've got this. I've got this. Uh, this this uh, complex curve C, and there's a singularity here, and so that's, it takes some four-ball neighborhood of that, and. Very small, you know, and then I look at the the boundary, the three sphere. Look at that intersection. With the code, this will be some knot. Maybe it's a link. But anyway, you say that the knot is um, algebraic if it if it arises as the the link of such a singularity. And um, it was recognized a long time ago that uh, next slide that that a lot, a lot of knots do arise in this way. In particular, famously, the torus knots. Can be described like this. So if you take positive coprime integers P and Q, if you look at this, uh, you know, if you look at the, the 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 complex curve defined by this equation, z1 to the p plus z2 to the q zero, then there's an isolated singularity, the origin, in fact, of C2, and the link is the torus knot PQ. Okay. So Milner studied uh, links of uh, links of isolated singularities with complex curves in, in all dimensions, actually, and and um, complex hypersurface proved a very nice uh, vibration theorem. And in the course of that investigation, he conjectured that the unknotting number of an algebraic knot uh, is the genus. So that's the, the Milner conjecture. And um, next slide. The, the fact that the genus is an upper bound for the unknotting number of an algebraic knot, I believe this is due to Pinkham. I, I, it's, it's a little unclear exactly who first proved this uh, to me, but um, I believe it was uh, Pinkham. Next slide. But then famously in 1993, using gauge theory, using some of the developments that arose out of Donaldson's 
a big big sort of breakthrough in that it proved not then in fact the slice genus is equal to the genus and therefore the unknowing number is equal to the genus because it, it's the unknowing number really okay and in particular the unknowing number of the pq torus not it's p minus one q minus one over two so the, anyway the milner conjecture is true for the Milner conjecture is true. So this was a this was a huge uh, advance in understanding of an unknowing number. And again, illustrating my point that I made right at the beginning. I mean, it uses some highly thought trivial mathematics, uh, and um, yeah. So this this unknowing number, it, it's it's really it seems very naive, but it's very hard to prove things about. So the Milner conjecture. It's true. Well, let, let me say something about some subsequent developments in this in this direction. So next, uh, yeah. So in two, around two thousand and three, um, Oswald Szabo defined uh, this Hagard Fleur uh, homology theory for three manifolds and version a version for knots um, was. Uh, <clears throat> Uh, they also did that as well later, also done by Rasmussen. And this eventually led to an invariant that they called tau of k, an integral invariant tau of k. And uh, similarly, okay, next slide. Um, the Jones polynomial eventually led to the Kavanov homology of knots and links, which uh, around 2000, um, it's a homology theory, who, a bigraded homology theory who's, Euler characteristic is, is the Jones polynomial. And that eventually led to Rasmussen defining an invariant S of K, which is a, some, an even integer. And those invariants, the absolute value of tau of K and the absolute value of S of K over two, just like the signature over two, um, they also uh, give lower bounds for the slight genus. And for alternating knots, they don't give anything new. They, they're, they're just essentially the signature. Next slide. But for algebraic knots, they just they, they give you the genus. And so again, and so now you get the next slide. And so by, by the one and three, you, you now get alternative proofs of the Miller, Miller conjecture uh, using, using those invariants. And I mean, th this was interesting in as much as I'd say the original proof used, you know, back, used gauge theory, whereas I mean, philosophically, it was kind of interesting that the, uh, in particular, this invariant, uh, th this development, I mean, it's purely combinatorial. I mean, there's no, there's no analysis in sight, really. And, uh, and, and so th this, so now, you know, people say, oh, now we have a purely combinatorial proof of the Miller conjecture. Anyway, so the, these were other, other um, invariants that, all, that also subsequently uh, le led, to, led to other proofs of the Miller conjecture. By the way, I should say that uh, if we just go back, 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 yeah, you see, here we have this, for algebraic knots, the unknowing number is the genus. In general, the unknowing number and the genus have nothing to do with each other. In fact, it's easy to, it's easy to see that there are knots with arbitrarily high genus and unknowing number one. I mean, that's, that's easy. It's also pretty clear that there are knots of genus one that are arbitrarily high on the number, but that's actually unknown. <laughs> Again, it's an, I mean, uh, an example of how little we know about this unknown number. It's very easy to write down knots of unknown number one with you know, 10 million crossings. It's, it's obvious <laughs> the unknown number is, you know, 3 million or whatever, but nobody knows, you know. So, okay. Um, but so, so the connection with the genus, okay. So, so where are we here? All right, we've just, um, all right. Okay, next slide. So let's, um, if you go, let's go back to our, um, the definition of the Gerritz matrix. Remember we took a shaded diagram. And if you think about it, you can think of these black regions as defining a surface. I mean, if you, if you go way back to the, one of the, way back, way, way back to the pictures of a, of a shaded diagram. It's a, sorry, I break your work so hard. It's, um, okay, okay, okay. We're getting close. Getting close. There, there. I mean, it's it's obvious you can think of this as a surface, right? 
you know, whose boundary is the knot, the shaded thing. I think so, but th this one, it's it's not orientable, but but that's all right. Um, it's a sort of okay. <laughs> a lot of work for not very much information. Okay, but um, uh, so when you shade the diagram, you've got this natural kind of shaded uh, surface whose boundaries are not, possibly not orientable. And now what you can do. Okay, what do we do with surfaces? We've already done this. We push the interior slightly into the four ball. And even though this guy's non-orientable, you can still define a double branch cover. Um, and so you get a, a four manifold um, by taking um, the double branch cover of the four branch over this pushed in surface. The boundary, of course, is the double branch cover of the knot. This manifold simply connected. Its intersection form is actually given by the Goritz matrix. So here's the Goritz matrix again coming up as, a, as the intersection form of a four manifold. Um, next slide. And now, remember we're interested, we're trying to get obstructions, let's say for a knot to have a knot number one. Well, if the knot does have a knot number one, then as we pointed out a long time ago, you see the double branch cover is this two K over minus one over two day surgery. This, this, is, this is just the determinant of the knot. And so it's easy then to see that you could construct a very simple four manifold with just uh, whose second homology is just uh, z plus z, um, and the intersection form on that is given by this this matrix. You just get it from this description of the double branch cover. You can easily then get a. You just take the four ball and you add two 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 handles, realizing this intersection form. So here you see what what have we got here? We've got two four manifolds. We've got v. And we've got W. One comes from the Goritz matrix, um, and you know the boundary is the double branch cover. Who we, here we have another four manifold with the same double branch cover, and it comes from the assumption that the unknown number is one. Well, next slide. If D is alternating, this is what makes alternating knots again really nice in this context. It turns out the Goritz matrix is then definite. And so now we've got these, this is, this is definite as well. So now we have these two definite four manifolds with the same boundary. And <clears throat> they therefore then give information, I won't go into details, about the Hagar for homology of this double branch cover, so-called. And we've got two four manifolds, and so we could compare the two pieces of information. And this led Osvath and Sabo to show that if you have, a, if you have an alternating knot with underdog number one, then you get a very strong condition, you see, uh, for it to uh, have another number, uh, another number one uh, in terms of the in terms of the Goritz matrix. So this was this was uh, this enabled them to. Before this work, uh, there were a whole bunch of ten crossing knots that nobody knew whether they had another number one or not, and they basically were able to set, settle settle all that. So that was um, again another kind of four dimensional um, <clears throat> type of argument, just using uh, Hagar for homology. And again, it goes back to our old friend, the Goritz matrix. Okay, next. So this was, that was in 2005. Now, Josh Green uh, sort of picked this up again a bit later. Um, you might, you, well, okay. It turns out you might as well, you can assume that V, let's say this four manifold, the same four manifold uh, br branched over this pushed in shaded surface. It's, we can assume it's positive definite. And this guy, um, the way I wrote it, it was negative definite. So we, if we if we glue them together along their boundary, you see this, they have the same boundary up to orientation, and so we get a smooth closed simply connected form of it with positive definite intersection form. And so by Donaldson's famous theorem, then the intersection form on this closed form manifold is just the standard diagonal form, uh, just with the standard sort of you know <laughs> orthonormal kind of uh, form. And so that means that the intersection form of V directs on this little two-dimensional form, embeds in this standard lattice, Z to the N. And Green showed that if you use that, together with the Osvath Sabo restrictions that I alluded to in the last slide, then you show this shows that the, this intersection form on the form manifold V, remember that's that double branch cover over the push. And so that's the one that's given by the Goritz matrix. It has to have a very special form. What was what, what he calls a change, ma change maker lattice. And again, sort of interesting, th th this condition on this lattice actually came up on Green's work on the two Dane surgery problems I alluded to earlier, the, the Cable conjecture and the Berge conjecture. 
he made very important progress on, on both those problems. And in both pieces of work, he used Donaldson's theorem and Hegel for much. And this same condition came up, this, this, uh, uh, the condition on this, uh, this, this lattice. This had to be a, a change maker lattice. It's a kind of joke. I mean, it's basically that. Well, anyway, you you have a you have, you have a certain vector in in, in this lattice, and you you, ex, you express it. Uh, so you have a certain vector in in here, and you express it as a linear combination of the standard bases. And it turns out that this change maker thing is that the coefficients satisfy the change maker condition. Is that you can you can realize any number less than or equal to the sum of the coefficients by just some subset of the coefficients. So you can always make change, you know, up to uh, up to uh, the maximum uh, amount of currency in circulation. You know, anyway, that was that's why he called it that change maker lab. But I guess it's sort of interesting that I mean, you know, with the two the two day in surgery questions that we've we've sort of used, you know, in part A. Of course, we're also using a little branch cover here too, but but in a much much deeper deeper way. And finally. So this line of argument was pushed further by McCoy. And so in 90, so he proved this great theorem. If you have an alternating diagram of a knot with a knot number one, then the diagram has a knot number one. So that's the ultimate sort of theorem for alternating knots with a knot number one. Um, in particular, again, um, the honor, you know, you can, I mean, it implies that you can decide uh, but, but but in fact he gave an you can decide just in the in the in the silly sense that if you had an alternating diagram you could just change every crossing and use Harkin. But in fact his proof gives a much much easier algorithm. It, it actually locates the crossing for you in terms of, of the Gerritz matrix. And so um, anyway, um, so again alternating knots turn out to be yeah we we can prove more about them. But even so the proofs are getting harder and harder, right? <laughs> um, okay. Yeah, so let me um, take a brief digression here. I, I can never resist talking about this when I'm talking about unknowing number. Um, so we've seen that, uh, you know, ch changing, allowing a knot to pass through itself. I mean, that's something that's come up a lot in, in our discussions. And um, Klein pointed out, and apparently it was that, that, you know, that you can't knot a circle in, in, in dimension four because you could just... You can always just pass it. Suppose it's in a three-dimensional plane, right? You'd like to unknot it, but you can't. But if you if you've got a fourth dimension, you can just zip into the fourth dimension, and and, uh, and so um, <clears throat> you see, you, you, like in the plane, you can't move this point outside the circle without hitting it. But you can if you allow yourself to jump into three dimensions. Klein apparently popularized. Apparently, this was a well-known fact. I mean, every educated person in Europe apparently at this time knew that you couldn't, un you, that any knot, you could untie it if you moved into the fourth dimension. And this was used, this, is, this was applied, this fact was applied by, um, next slide, by uh, Henry Slade, who was a well-known well -known figure. Um, he was not a mathematician, he was a medium. So Henry Slade was a, a well-known medium uh, in the latter part of the 19th century. And um, he was American, but he, he spent a lot of time in Europe. So he would hold seances and he would contact the spirits of the departed and get messages from them, um, writing on slates, the usually kind of stuff, you know. And he made his living by swindling people out of money for this kind of thing. And um, he came, he came to England and he was, some people got a bit annoyed with him and, and they sort of went along to one of his seances and sort of switched on the lights or whatever, you know, and had him arrested for fraud. And he was actually convicted of fraud. He was sentenced to three months hard labor in England, but he got off on a technicality, went off to Europe and continued his, his work as a medium. It was a famous case, his trial was famous. Um, Spiritualism was very popular at that time. And Andrew Wallace, you know, Darwin's uh, the guy who independently came up with the idea of that. He spoke in Slade's defense uh, in his trial. And 
destroyed his scientific reputation by that. So it was kind of important in the, in the history of science. But but Slade was also really, he was really good. Now, what's this got to do with knots? I hear you cry. Uh, next, next, next slide. Okay. So, so Zellner, actually, maybe, maybe back. So there was a physicist in Leipzig called Friedrich Zellner who got interested in Slade and he decided to test, you know, under very stringent conditions whether Slade really was a true medium, you know. So one of the things that Slade did to prove that he had access to the fourth dimension, next slide, he would take an unknotted loop of string and he would magically sort of, you know, do something. And suddenly knots would appear, you see. And this proved that he had access to the fourth dimension, which was where this, that was the spirit, you see. So he, he was, I'm not making this up. And, um, and so Zellner, of course, being a physicist, he believed it. You know, he, he was completely convinced by, by Slade. <laughs> and uh, so he, he says, yes, if a single, this, this, is, this is an illustration from Zellner's book. If a single cord has its end tied together and sealed, an intelligent being having the power voluntarily to produce on this cord four-dimensional bendings and movements must be able, without loosening the seal, to tie one or more knots in this. So this is one of, one of Slade's tricks, you see. In fact, later on, Zilna says he was so impressed. He said, Slade actually tied four, four knots. He said one would have sufficed, but he tied four. So by notice by Vent's theorem, Slade must have entered the fourth dimension at least four times, right? Because that was uh, you know, not, <laughs> um, the, the connected sum of four copies of the trifold of Hazard number four. So that was a, that's a sort of applied knot theory. Actually, if you go, go, go back, go back, uh, back, go. Oh yeah, sorry. Go for, forward, yeah. You'll notice that this this book here this actually belonged to Arthur Conan Doyle, and uh, and he wrote here it shows once for all that Slade was a true medium. See, Conan Doyle actually he was a big supporter of Slade. He came a little after, later, but he thought Slade had been very badly treated. He admitted that Slade did sometimes cheat, but he said, if a man passes a bad check, that doesn't mean to say that every check he writes is bad. And you, you think, this is the guy who wrote Sherlock Holmes? I don't know. <laughs> next slide, next slide. Okay, so much for the levity. Um, so let me just finish with, 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 some, with, with some, some questions. I mean, um, so let's get back to our original uh, yeah one of our original questions is is is, is this computer and it's, it's to me it's, it's really fascinating because it's really it's really hard to, if i had to bet you know it'd be i would have a hard time deciding because it's sort of a three-dimensional thing you know and everything in, in about three-dimensional topology has turned out to be decidable the homeomorphism problem for three miles is, is decidable it's solvable. I mean, that, that was that's a result of Perlman, you know, geometry. And so, but on, on the other hand, the homeomorphism for four manifolds, that, that's unsolvable. And we've seen that the unknown number, I mean, it sort of has a four dimensional sort of aspect to, I mean, is the slice genus computable? Can you decide whether or not the slice genus is zero? I mean, you know, who knows? I don't know. So I think that whether or not the compute, the, the, whether or not the unknown number is computable is, is a really fascinating question. If you think of it as a three-dimensional thing, well, yeah, it should be, but maybe it's not quite three-dimensional. Next question. We don't even know, as I've alluded to before, we don't even know whether you can decide whether or not or not is on the number one. And again, um, okay, next. I didn't actually mention this, but I mentioned that the unknotting number of, an, of a non-trivial connected sum is always greater than one. But an obvious conjecture, I guess, is that the unknotting number is additive, right? You see, the unknotting number of a sum, it's certainly no more than the sum of the unknotting numbers, right? The question is, maybe it's, maybe it's less, you know? No, nobody knows. Uh, in fact, our ignorance on this is so extensive. Here is an alternating knot with eight crossings that we don't know it's unknotting number. It's the, it's the connected sum of the 2-5 torus knot and the mirror image 
of the two three Torah stones. The other number of this guy is two. The other number of this guy is one. So the other number of this guy is certainly no more than three. And it's not one because it's a non-trivial connected sum. But nobody knows that it isn't two. I mean, this is really pathetic. Do we have some good Oh, well, no, I mean, it's obviously three. It's obviously three. I mean, <laughs> right. Quote, obviously. I mean, yeah. I mean, you, I mean, this, this, this is probably true, right? You see? But this is a very special case of this. We don't even know. Um, and I, let me just mention that you, you, you reflect. If, you, if we didn't take the mirror image here, then the signature would the signatures would both be negative and they just added. The signature would tell you, no, no, that, that has a number three. But if you change the orientation here, the signature gets flipped on this guy. And so the signature here is only is only negative two. So it only tells you the other number is it's not zero, which is not very helpful. We already knew that. Um, and so that's amazing. Um, OK, next slide. On the other hand, if we stick to prime knots, um, at least the unknowing number is known for all prime knots up to nine crossings. And the ones with unknowing number one they're known, they're not known up, up, up to 10 crossings. So let me just point out finally the, the, the first ones we don't know. So, so here's a, this is the first 10 crossing knot whose unknowing number we don't know. It's an alternating knot, and it's actually a two bridge knot. Yeah, so next. Uh, again, we can inspect and see that it's, it's at most three. But nobody knows maybe it's two. Nobody can show that it's not two. It's not one, because it's not one of the ones of the canon of the Kami But But um, in fact, did I say this? Uh, oh, OK, maybe not. Oh, so this, uh, and, and this is oh, the next one then. And this is the first, um, this is the first knot we don't know whether or not it has other number one. So, so this is necessarily a non-alternating knot, right? Because remember, for alternating knots, we do know when they have unknown number one, which is by, by McCoy's theorem. So here's a non-alternating knot, and presumably it has other number two, but nobody can prove that it doesn't have another number one. And finally, <laughs> if you're interested in numerology, this is a this is a a, a two bridge knot. So the determinant of this knot is forty three. This is it's, this is the two bridge knot forty three over ten. The determinant of this knot is forty three. So, so the, the two smallest knots that we don't know have the same determinant. I point out that forty three is forty two plus one. So maybe that's relevant, but I don't know. Let me let me finish. We'll give the last word to Tate. There must be some very simple method of determining the amount of knottedness for any given knot, but I have not hit upon it. So it's interesting that he thought that because this was such a easily defined invariant, it must be easily compute, computed. Well, we don't even know if it can be computed. I mean, it, so as, I, as I say, I find it a fascinating invariant, and our ignorance on it is quite extensive. But again, the things we do know, I mean, involve some of the, yeah, some of the deepest bits of mathematics that have been produced, you know, in the last, uh, last uh, couple of centuries. So thank you very much.